in the short term, what has happened is the Middle East crisis, as well as the Russian and Ukraine war, has. And if something goes wrong in Swiss Canal, the Swiss Canal is stopped, and let's say the terrorists of Houthis block the Swiss Canal, the freight rates are going to go up. Eighty-five percent of India's oil consumption depends upon imports. What if the oil price goes up? What happens to our foreign exchange? I think in the middle of October 2024, the big question to everyone is, will a war take place? Will it escalate? My short answer is, a CFO of tomorrow is someone who is going to predict the future. The CFO of tomorrow will have to handle technology, which is AI and others. And CFO of tomorrow is a CEO of tomorrow. Therefore, the expectations for the CFO community has completely changed. My advice for CFOs is... Robin, thank you so much for making the time and joining us. We frequently hear about geopolitical tensions in the news nowadays and since a year almost. So from a business and finance perspective, what does this really mean? What is a geopolitical crisis or tension? Very often we use this word without perhaps understanding what it is. Geo means geography, politics means politics, polit means politics, of course. Therefore, any tension or any risk which is or which could arise because of geographical location and the political issues between two nations or two regions or multi regions, politics, geography, and finance or commercial plays role in within each other, every war, every war, or almost ev almost all the wars have commercial reasons behind it. Somebody is trying to control some resources, some money, some area. And therefore, the geopolitical tension means when there are two regions or two countries entering into a tension or a tussle, which could result in rub of effect for other regions or the world as a whole. Wow, so well explained. Cool. So Robin, that brings me to my next question. Okay, so why is the Middle East so important for the global economy and for India? When you say the word Middle East, it is middle of the world. It is in the middle of the world. And if there is crisis or tension or war in the middle of the world, how will people reach each other? The most important issue of the Middle East crisis is oil. Oil, oil, and oil, which is energy. The world's, the, the, the largest source of energy of the world is oil, and 100 million barrels of oil is produced every day. Of this 100 million barrels, 22 million barrels are produced in USA. The second country which produces the second highest oil is 11 million barrels per day. And the third one is Russia, again, 11 million barrels per day. So, so far, so good. Now, what happens to the Middle East? Saudi Arabia produces 11 million barrels. And Iran, which is currently at the heart of the Middle East crisis, produces 4 million barrels per day. That means... 4% of the world's oil is produced in a country which is now embroiled in a tussle or a tension. The question is, can 4 million affect the balance 96%? Answer is perhaps no from a commercial point of view. But from economics point of view, just imagine it's demand and supply. The moment supply gets affected in any way, the demand goes up or the apparent demand goes up, the price keeps going up. That's what is happening over the last few days as I'm talking to you in the middle of October. That the price of oil is going up because there is a feeling that Iran might join the war in a big way. Current economic crisis or the geopolitical Middle East, Middle East crisis essentially is traveling between the two parts of the world because Middle East is Middle East and they are middle of everything. And if there is a war, how do you travel between the, each part of the world? Number two, it's oil, oil and oil. And of course, and of course, if there are uncertainty, then many other rub of effect takes place. But I believe it's a travel or connectivity and the oil, which are the two most fundamental issues 
which are creating or which is giving us sleepless nights. So when you talk about travel, Robin, is it air travel? Is it sea travel? Like, could you elaborate a little bit on, on that aspect? But the most important, because it's Middle East, <clears throat> every almost every sea cargo going from Western part to the Eastern part of the world and vice versa has to necessarily go through mostly about 90% through the Swiss Canal. And Swiss Canal is in the middle of the Middle East. That couldn't be more middle than anything else. So there is Yemen, there is Saudi Arabia, there is Egypt, all hovering around this in the Swiss Canal, with Egypt controlling the Swiss Canal. And perhaps the, the bad news is Yemen has um, a group called Houthis yes. who are trying to who are trying to um, make trouble uh, in the in, in the middle in the, the Swiss Canal. So yes, it's both passenger travel and goods goods transit or transportation which is at risk as of now. In fact, as a country, Egypt, uh, which is about half a trillion dollar economy, uh, eighty percent of the foreign currency comes either from the Swiss Canal transportation toll collection or tourism. So the country's economy is based on Swiss Canal. So it's very significant. And if you look at the world, if Swiss Canal somehow gets choked or stopped, the, 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 the goods have to now go through via the South African region and completely down from, South, from South Africa which enhances the freight by about 40 to 50 percent. Not only that, in fact, in the recent past, the freight yeah. rates have gone up by two to three times because of apparent problems in the Swiss Canal area, maybe an unhealthy attack or whatever, a terrorist, terrorist attack. So again, demand supply, people think, oh, Swiss Canal is unsafe. Let me go around the world. I'm not going to ship now. Let me wait. So the whole demand supply or the sentiment in the world market gets completely affected, especially in the freight sector. But when we're talking about India, when how do you specifically connect the Middle East with India, be it the freight, be it the supply chain, be it manufacturing or the passenger, like the air travel and all of that? Each one of them is playing a part, but the first part is oil, oil and oil. What if the oil price goes up? There are news reports saying, as I'm talking to you, oil is hovering between 80 to 82 dollars per barrel. These are all Brent crude, which is about 80, 70 percent of the world's crude is Brent crude. In, in, in fact, in a year back, it was about 90. To tell you that, in fact, it has gone down. It is going up and coming down, depend upon time, time, time to time. Yeah. The question here is, India consumes five million barrels of oil per day that's the consumption whereas produces only 0.7 million barrel not even 1 million barrel 85 percent of india's oil consumption depends upon imports and and if the price goes up the foreign exchange outflow will go up and therefore our current account deficit can go for a complete success this is the biggest risk India is facing. What if the oil price goes up? What happens to our foreign exchange? There is a general uh, feeling that things are not going well. So therefore, I would postpone my consumption. And if humans postpone consumption, economic activities do not take place. And if economic activities do not take place, recession sets in. So everything is bad around it. But again, as far as India is concerned, it boils, it boils back to oil, oil and oil. In the short term, what has happened is the Middle East crisis, as well as the Russian and Ukraine yeah. war, has enhanced the freight rates. So export imports cost has the cost has gone up. <clears throat> the freight rates have really got affected. And if something goes wrong in Swiss Canal, the Swiss Canal is stopped, and let's say the terrorists or the Houthis block the Swiss Canal, the freight rates are going to go up. The export imports are going to go for a complete success. That is the biggest risk. And of course, oil, as I said, um, any 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 problem in the Middle East would send the oil price much higher and therefore the current account deficit. So um, 
if the freight rate goes up, export input will definitely suffer. Um, and therefore, there is going to be, or there could be a huge impact in India. Why in India? Almost every country in the world, because everyone depends on export import. By the way, India has 20% export intensity. That means 20% of GDP of our country depends on foreign foreign trade. And if that 20% goes to a, into a problem, and the balance 80% gets into a problem because oil price hike, you can well imagine the whole economy goes into a great difficult arena. If I'm a CFO right now, okay, what factor should I take into consideration? Right, I could be in the manufacturing sector, I could be in the service industry sector. How does it, how will it impact me? And what should I prep exactly for? Um, in uncertain world, in, when, when it comes to risk, uh, it's always a question of risk management and therefore how we can mitigate risk. So we have to take this whole uh, cake into parts and see which are the parts I can, I can take an insurance or do something to mitigate risk. First is foreign currency risk or foreign exchange risk. Dollar rupee risk, euro rupee risk. A war is going on, but if it escalates, then the currency the foreign exchange rate of Indian currency is going to be will will be will be negative. That means rupee is going to weaken and dollar will strengthen. He has weakened a little bit yesterday and crossed 84.0. Now, assuming it becomes 86 or 87, the imports will become much more expensive. Of course, it will be good for exports. So a CFO or a CEO could hedge foreign currencies, at least hedge 50% of your exposure. 50% of your net exposure, exports minus imports, whatever is left, please hedge 50%, if not more, because that is something which is which you can take steps to mitigate risk. Number two, if you have to take insurance on your facilities in India or abroad, take it because what if a bomb gets dropped? So um, ap appropriate insurance about terrorism, about fire or flood or water, um, please take an insurance on that. Number three, number three, negotiate freight rates with your suppliers, with your freight companies as much as possible. But let me tell you, no freight company as of now will give you us, will, will give you a long-term freight contract. They will always say, okay, my price is $200 per ton, but should anything happen, it can, it, uh, I will be forced to raise the rates. Or, or if you have a fixed contract, they will not give you container. They will not give you ships. They will not give you, uh, what will you do? If, if they will refuse to give you um, space in the ship because they are not going to incur losses. So if you can post pre pone some decisions today, export today or import today, do it. Do it as early as possible because that's what is in within our control. Whatever it is within our control, do an ABC analysis, see what is control, what is not controllable. What is not controllable, nothing can be done. But some things, for instance, and uh, for its foreign exchange risks, perhaps we can control in a big way. My advice for CFOs is many of us, or perhaps most of us have stopped reading. We need to read. We need to understand what's going around around us. This, if there is a trouble, the CEO is going to call you, the CFO, or the finance guy. Hello, Miss Swanso, Mr. Swanso. What is happening? Do you think something is going to have is happening? Means we need to read. Is these WhatsApp messages and YouTube um, YouTube uh, announcements good enough? The answer is no. So we need to read. We need to read good magazines like Financial Times and The Economist, and at least a good newspaper. A CFO of tomorrow is someone who is going to predict the future. The CFO of tomorrow will have to handle technology, which is AI and others. And CFO of tomorrow is a CEO of tomorrow. Therefore, the expectations for the CFO community has completely changed. And in any case, CFO is the crutch for the CEO. And that power you must give to your CEO. Financial Times is expensive, but it is worth the while. And The Economist magazine. And whichever country you are staying, please read a good economic newspaper of that country. Three things, if you read, you are done and you are dusted. A would be at par with the best of the world. Robin, you know, you've got almost three, over three decades of experience, you know, starting your career to, you know, CFO, controller, CEO. So what are the major crises that you've encountered over the years? 
So can you share how did you or your company or your team respond to each one or any major crisis? Yes, the global meltdown 2008, the financial crisis, <clears throat> that was a big one. I used to manage a steel company that time, a large one, one of the largest in the world. And, and suddenly the demand vanished. There was a global crisis, economic crisis, and nobody wants to buy anything. So what do you do? The pandemic happened in, unannounced in 2022. It just came, 21, 22, it just came. Nobody knew. So as a business person, please keep some cash as a buffer. Should something goes on, goes wrong, you would be able to at least maintain your affairs, maintain your business. Not whatever goes up comes down and whatever goes down and comes up. So the business cycle and oscillation is natural and normal. There'll be tough times and not so tough times. The good news is the crisis normally doesn't last more than four to six months. That's the worst period of a financial or a geopolitical crisis. And whoever could bypass it, they survived and of course flourished later on. Amazing. You know, so Robin, uh, would you, is there any point that I've missed which you feel you've got to address with this uh, Middle East crisis and India's impact? I think in middle of October 2024, the big question to everyone is, will a war take place? Will it escalate? My short answer is, given the context where we are, I don't think it will. It will pass. The Russian-Ukrainian war is going on for two years. It hasn't escalated. Similarly, here also, it's unlikely to escalate. Unlikely that Iran will join. No other large Middle East countries are going to join. Robin, thank you so much for, the, for your time.